pivot in the previous lecture we talked about uh, five methods through which controllers are designed and methods also there are many many other controllers but uh, the five ones that i mentioned are the first one and uh, the one that we are going to discuss today is the optimization method so i'm going to talk about two methods specifically one is dynamic programming and minimal dynamic programming these are the two topics we are going to study today Okay, so we talked about optimization. We talked about KKT theorem. That was for solving a static problem. So you have one variable, uh, and you want to optimize that particular vector given the performance metric. Uh, typically, static problems are not that useful for control systems, but you can solve a sequence of static problems to solve a dynamic optimization problem, and that's what we are going to be studying today. So this is the optimization problem i want to minimize summation of ct xt and ut t goes from 1 to capital t such that gt of xt ut less than equal to 0 ht of xt ut equals to 0 that's my optimization problem and i want to minimize over all gamma t that maps xt to ut so my action control action is supposed to be a function of the state so if you think about an autonomous system if you think about autonomous vehicles if you think about the building energy management system you think about an industrial process about a wind farm in all of these different autonomous systems uh there is a state that is being measured in the case of a building energy management system we are measuring the temperature of every room every segment of the building and there is action that is being taken in figuring out how much compressor to run how much cold air to pump in each of the rooms and we want to figure out what is this mapping gamma t that maps the state to the action what is the mapping that maps the temperature of individual rooms in the building to how much air should be pumped into each of the how much cold air should be pumped into each of the rooms okay uh, typically the performance metric as we had talked about in the earlier classes the performance metric is i want to minimize the energy consumption i want to improve the tracking error uh, i want to minimize the tracking error i want to minimize the uh, the performance of the battery pack in an hybrid vehicle i want to improve the lifetime of a wind farm so there could be multiple performance metric and depending on what you're trying to optimize uh you will have the main performance metric here and some of the other performance metrics could go into the constraints oh and i also forgot to write my, i am a i have a dynamical system So x t plus one equals to f t of x t comma u t. So right now I'm not considering any disturbance. Uh, I'm assuming that there is no disturbance in the system and the state evolves in a very very deterministic fashion. We'll add more disturbances and complications uh, in the towards the later part of this lecture and also towards the. uh end of september when we'll talk about stochastic systems so right now there is no uncertainty okay so now the question is if it were a static problem and there was no time in this particular problem we know exactly how to solve it we studied that in the previous class now we have a time axis and we want to optimize the overall performance metric over capital t time period Uh, depending on the uh, the time the t from 1 to 2 could be 1 millisecond it could be 1 second it could be 1 hour it could be 1 day it really depends on how much uh, how much distance how, how how you are discretizing the time 
in, for the purpose of this particular optimization problem. Okay. So, how do we solve this problem? Well, the way to solve this problem is to apply what is known as the principle of dynamic programming. And the principle of dynamic programming, oh, I need to add one more, one more cost, which is the terminal cost. So the principle of dynamic programming says that in order to solve a dynamic optimization problem, so this is a dynamic optimization problem because we have a time axis. In order to solve a dynamic optimization problem, we have to solve the tail of the subproblem first. So we solve the tail of the subproblem, then we create a bigger subproblem, then we solve the tail of the sub, that subproblem, and so on and so forth. So if you apply, I mean, there is a whole bunch of theory that goes behind dynamic programming, which will be covered in 5500 that I'm concurrently teaching, and whose lectures are also posted on YouTube. Uh, but we'll do it uh, in that particular course, we'll do it uh, towards early November. So anyways, it's not covered right now in that course. But the principle of dynamic programming says as follows, if I want to solve this particular problem, here is how to solve it. So I am going to first solve the following problem. I want to minimize over U capital T of C, C, T, X, T, U, T plus C capital T plus 1. No, capital T. I need to use capital T everywhere. <clears throat> so if you notice, uh, yeah, I'll let you guys write and then we'll discuss this expression. Oh, this is uh, V capital T and then gamma capital T Yes. Is the other cost function in the summation or is that outside the summation? Uh, it is in the summation. So this depends on this depends on time. So that time goes from one to capital T. This one is a terminal cost. I believe I'm supposed to write it as T plus one. Yeah, C T plus one. That's okay. Yeah, sure. Okay, uh, there are still people writing, I'll just wait. Okay, so here is the deal. I want to solve this particular problem. I have a running cost, I have a terminal cost, I have a bunch of inequalities that equalities and inequality constraints that needs to be satisfied at all points of time. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm only going to look at the, the tail of the optimization problem. So what is the tail of this optimization problem? I'm going to look at the cost at time capital T. So remember capital T is the terminal time here. 
So I'm looking at the cost at capital T and the terminal cost C capital T plus one, which depends on the terminal state. And then the uh, constraints are also uh, the terminal constraints. So I'm not looking at any of the stuff that is happening before the terminal time, capital T. I can for each xt, for each value of xt, so let's say my state is, my, my xt can take uh, 500 values. So for each of those 500 values, I get an optimization problem, which is purely a function of ut. So there's only ut here. This one is equal to f capital T xt ut. So I look at this particular cost. So this is also, if I fix my x capital T, I get a function of ut. I fix capital xt, I get a function of ut. And I fix capital xt and I get functions of ut. Now it's just a constraint optimization problem of the form that we talked about in the previous lecture, towards the end of previous lecture. We can apply the KKT theorem to solve this particular problem and get the value of ut star. Right? That's the minimizing value. Uh, so the, the position, the ut, uh, which minimizes the entire function and also satisfies the constraint, that argument becomes my gamma t of xt. And this min the value uh, of this particular thing, which is ct of xt u star t and plus ct plus 1 xt u star t, that becomes my value function, v of t. So what I mean is my gamma t of xt equals to ut star and my vt of xt equals to ct of ut star plus ct plus 1 that is my optimal so this is my optimal policy at time t. And this is the value function. At time capital T. So I get two things when I'm solving this optimization problem. I'm getting an optimal, va I'm getting a value function and I'm getting an optimal policy. How many times do you need to solve this problem at the terminal time step? I have to solve it for each value of xt. So suppose my xt, the state, goes from 0 to 1 and 0 to 1. That's my xt. So this is, my xt could lie anywhere within this 0, 1 cross 0, 1. That's where my state could lie. Then I need to discretize the state space. So I'll pick points. So what is, this is known as discretization. This is my x1, x1, and this is my x2. Uh, sorry, I, uh, I mean x1 capital T and x2 capital T. So I have like x1 capital T and x2 capital T. It lies in the 0, 1 cross 0, 1 region. So I now need to discretize the entire state space. So what I've done is figured out some discrete points within this space. Now at each of these points, I'm going to plug in. So what is this point? So this point is 0, 0. So I'm going to plug in 0, 0 here, 0, 0 here, 0, 0 here, 0, 0 here. Solve this problem. Then I'm going to go to this point, which is 1, 0. I'm going to plug in 1, 0 here, 1, 0 here, 1, 0 here, 1, 0 here, 1, 0 here. And I solve the optimization problem all over again. And then I go to this point, 
and I solve this optimization all over again. And every time I solve it, I get a UT star for, for that particular XT. So I store that UT star in this function gamma T of XT, and I store the optimal value in VT of XT. Okay, I have to do it for all of these points, all of these points, discretized points in the state space. As you make discretization finer and finer, the number of optimization problems you need to solve also grows exponentially. So many a time solving this optimization problem, each of these optimization problem for each XT might take, uh, let's say, one microsecond. Let's say that's the time it takes to solve this problem. And you have 1,000 points like this in the space that you have to calculate it on the total time will become one millisecond in order to solve this optimization problem for one time step. Remember, we are not solving for all capital T time steps yet. We are only solving it for one time step. So it's going to take one millisecond to solve it for one time step. So that's something we need to keep in mind. Okay. Now once I do that, then I have to go back one step earlier. I have to look at capital T minus one. I have to set up this problem all over again and I have to solve this problem. So let's see how to solve the capital T minus one step. But before I move on to capital T minus one, any questions on this part? No? Okay. Okay, so I have solved the 1000 optimization problems arising at capital time T. Now I have to go back one step and I have to solve this problem. And then I have gamma star Correct. We need to know which we are going to. Correct. But that is, uh, that depends on the sense, I mean, the information which we receive. That's right. That's right. That's right. So in most of these situations, uh, when you are applying this optimization problem, you know what system you are trying to optimize. You know exactly everything about that system. You know the entire dynamics of the system. Or at least you have some approximate model of the system. So if you're trying to optimize the temperature of this room, you have some approximate model of the temperature of this room. Okay. Now, uh, it really depends on industry to industry and problem statement to problem statement whether you will be applying this algorithm for controller design or whether you'll be using PID controller or lead lag controller that we talked about. Now, uh, if you look at the thermal modeling of this room, they are probably using PID controller. They're not using anything fancier like this. Uh, but if you look at an autonomous vehicle going on the road, they're actually using much more sophisticated algorithm than what we are talking about here. And then there is everything in between. Uh, imagine the, uh, like if you look at the mining and petroleum industry, uh, when they are extracting, let's say the crude oil from the ground or from the seabed, 
or if they are extracting ores from the uh, from the ground, uh, they need to crush the entire. I mean, in the case of crude oil, of course, the uh, how much. So when you extract it, it's not like you're getting like the purest form of crude oil. You're getting crude oil and you're getting sand and you're getting rocks and you're getting like all kinds of stuff along with the crude oil. And so the problem there is, um, uh, the problem there is that you need to figure out what is it that you are trying to optimize. What is the performance that you are trying to optimize? So sometimes you want to get the best uh, crude oil out of it or you want to get the best, uh, you want to crush the ore to a certain fine size, uh, you know, in order to then extract the minerals from the ore. So all of those problems, uh, depending on a lot of different historical reasons, you might be using one controller over the other. And uh, there is no way you can go and change those things at this point of time, right? So uh, to give you an example, if Siemens is the one making the ore crusher, let's say that's the situation. If you are in the mining industry, you cannot change the controller. If you are in Siemens, you can propose to use more sophisticated, so more sophisticated controller than PID controllers to better optimize the overall mining process. Now, whether they will accept it or reject it is up to them to decide. But uh, what I'm saying is that this, these algorithms, depending on the situation, depending on the industry you go to, you may be able to use these algorithms or you may not be able to use these algorithms. And hopefully, when you have the comprehensive overview of here are the 10 algorithms or 10 classes of algorithms to design controllers, you will be able to make the judgment whenever you go to whatever company you go. Uh, to give you an example, Honeywell and Siemens and Vertiv, Vertiv is a Columbus based company. All these three are in the thermal management sort of area of buildings, data centers, industrial centers and so on. Um, and if you want to design, so the, the old ones, which is what we have here, will be using PID. The newer ones will be using optimization-based methods for control design. Uh, but you need to know what these functions are. You need to know what these functions are. You need to know what these constraints are. Sometimes these constraints and functions are easy to know. In the case of a car, it's very easy to know because you pretty much have the model of the car. Uh, in the case of, uh, uh, I don't know, a oil drilling machine, you probably wouldn't know the correct FT and the correct GT and ST. You will have some approximations of it. Um, in the case of an, uh, in the case of a building thermal management, you will have approximate values of this. Uh, in the case of a battery pack optimization, so one of my, one of the students who took uh, optimization class seven, eight years ago, he's now in Apple and he does optimization of the battery charging and discharging process for the iPhones. Okay, iPhones, iPads, all of this, so the battery management system. So there, you may not even know what FT and GT and HT. I mean, you might know a little bit about GT and HT, for instance, how much current you can inject in the battery and how much current you can withdraw, but you won't have the complete visibility into FT of the system. So anyways, depending on the industry structure, depending on the situation, you may or may not know many of these terms, but if you know it, this is the algorithm you can apply. <clears throat> okay. Uh, so uh, this is what we did in the final time step. We know all of this stuff. Uh, we for each XT, we solve this optimization problem. We stored it in a table, in a lookup table, uh, one of which is the optimal policy. One of them is the value function at time t. Then I go back one step back. I look at the cost at time t minus one. I look at the value function from here. So it's the same value function that appears here. But remember, Vt is a function of x capital T. So I'm replacing X capital T with FT minus one, XT minus one, UT minus one. I have the two constraint at time T minus one, which I have implemented. Now for each of the discretized values of XT minus one, I'll have to solve this optimization problem and I'll have to store the gamma T and I'll have to store the VT minus one, just like we did it here, 
Okay, I'll have to store it. So you you solved a thousand a thousand optimization problems here. You will solve another thousand optimization problems here, and you will keep going all the way one one step at a time. And so finally, what you will try to solve is as follows. Vt of xt Okay, and then you will have the usual gamma t of xt equals to argument. The same thing all over again. So at each step, you are going to solve a thousand optimization problems. Each optimization problem might take you one millisecond, one microsecond, depending on the complexity of the problem. And solving the capital T time steps will then get appropriately scaled. So you will have capital T times how you are discretizing the state space xt, uh, you will have those many optimization problems to solve in order to solve the entire optimization problem completely. And you will get gamma t, you will get gamma star t minus 1, gamma t minus 1. And then you will get vt, uh, yeah, so you will get like a whole bunch of gamma t's. So the way to solve dynamic problem is to start from the back and go one step at a time and you get the optimal policy, the optimal policy at all time t and you get the value function at all time t. So you have to store both these things in a lookup table. So the memory requirement for dynamic programming is extremely high. Computational complexity of dynamic programming is extremely high. But this is the only way to solve dynamic programming problems. I mean, not the only way. There are other ways too. But uh, this is the uh, this gives you what is known as a closed loop feedback control, like where the policy depends on x t minus one, which is the class of problems we are trying to solve in this class. <clears throat> Any questions so far on the dynamic programming algorithm? We'll use, we'll look at an example of the dynamic programming algorithm for tracking in the next class. Uh, but this is the algorithm we are, uh, uh, this is the underlying like basis for the algorithm. Questions? Um, I'll give you an, a, a small example uh, because we are on the topic of dynamic programming. So about six, seven years ago, we were working on optimizing a hybrid vehicle, uh, fuel efficiency of a hybrid vehicle. So the cost function was how much fuel is getting consumed. We had all the transition kernel and stuff. These uh, inequalities came from typical, we didn't have equality constraint there. The inequality constraints came from like how much uh, uh, current we can inject in the battery, how quickly we can decelerate the car, how quickly we can accelerate the car, uh, and how much is the distance with the vehicle in front, uh, what's the, how much is the relative velocity with respect to the vehicle in front, what's the velocity with respect to the stop sign, how far is the stop sign from our current position, and so on. So there were a whole, whole lot of inequalities here, and the cost function was to try to optimize. And uh, in that particular problem, when we were running the dynamic programming algorithm, it took us 200 milliseconds to solve the dynamic programming algorithm for 100 meters. So the time, the, the time axis was basically divided into 10 meters chunk. So we want to solve for the 10 meters, and then 10 meters, and then 10 meters. So the capital T was like, capital T was around 10. And it took us 200 milliseconds to solve the problem. And uh, it was not good enough. We had to solve it under 100 milliseconds. 
So we needed to come up with uh, additional complex algorithms on top of dynamic programming to make sure we are able to solve it in 100 milliseconds. So the reason why I'm telling you this is just because we have the algorithm doesn't necessarily mean that you will be able to implement it in the specific system for controller design uh, because uh, it may not meet the safety criteria for the vehicle or for the, for the machine that you are trying to optimize for. Okay, so always keep in mind, safety always comes first, okay? So you can have a simple algorithm, but as long as it's safe and it's able to execute in time, it's much better than having a sophisticated algorithm that takes five seconds to compute and by the time the disaster might have already happened. So just something to keep in mind. Any question? Okay. So we talked about the dynamic programming algorithm. Uh, this is an algorithm for solving an optimization problem which is deterministic in nature, uh, where you have state and action, and that's all. And you have a cost function, and you have some equality and inequality constraints. Um, Fmincon can be used for solving these problems, just, uh, just so you know. Now, uh, the problem is that in some cases we have disturbances and we want, to, we want to design a controller for the worst case disturbance. Whatever is the worst case that can happen, I want to design my controller so that it works in the worst case. So how do we do that? Uh, to give you an example, I have an ore, uh, ore crushing machine. I bought it from some manufacturer and you know if you, if you extract minerals from the earth, each of them will have different hardness. So depending on at what, like millions of years if they were, um, if the minerals came out millions of years ago for whatever reason, it might have a different hardness than the minerals that came 200 million years ago, right? So as you are going deeper and deeper into the earth crust, to extract minerals, you might have different hardness. And you don't know what the hardness is earlier, like upfront. So you extract the mineral, you put it in the machine, and it's crushing it. And suddenly the minerals are very, very difficult, very, very uh, uh, stiff. And now you need to crush those rocks as well, and so on and so forth. So in those cases, you want to design the machine and you want to design the controller that can take rocks off a wide range of grades, okay? And you want to design the controller that can be robust to all of these different variations in the, in the, uh, in the kind of rocks it's going to see over its lifetime. And re remember, these are like 30 year, 40 year long lifetime machines. So they really need to work for 40 years um, under very different conditions of operating conditions and so on. So how do you do that controller design? So we'll do some minor modifications to this dynamic programming algorithm to be able to solve that problem. So let's see how to model and then solve that problem. That's called a minimax uh, DP or robust control design. Again, there are thousands of algorithms for designing robust controllers. We are just considering one of them which is easier to understand. And if you need uh, more information on that, you, are, uh, you can take more advanced courses in the EC department or mechanical and aerospace engineering department to study robust control. So here is the problem. I have WT, which is the disturbance. My state, ex state space, uh, the state evolution is depends on WT, the disturbance. And my cost function is I want to solve I want to minimize over all gamma t summation of CT
Oh, uh, sorry, I need to do the maximization over WT. So that's how the name minimax came from. So I'm minimizing over the action, but I'm maximizing over all feasible WT, all feasible uh, noise variable, disturbance variable. Okay. How do you think you would solve this problem? Knowing well what dynamic programming does, what do you think you are going to do differently here in this case? Remember that the, the policy, the control policy only depends on xt. So you're not observing, the controller is not observing the disturbance. The crushing machine is not observing the, uh, the hardness of the rocks that it is crushing. Um, the, if you're going on a flight, the disturbance is caused by turbulence in the air, and the flight is not observing the turbulence in the air. It's out there, and the flight still has to fly through the turbulence and get to the destination. Okay? So the pilot doesn't see the turbulence, but pilot does see the state of the, uh, of the aircraft, what the current altitude is, what the current velocity is, what the current uh, angle of attack is, and so on and so forth, right? So, typically aircraft has six or seven or eight different states. I forgot how many states it has. So, the pilot is seeing all those eight states of the system and deciding how to control the aircraft, but it's not able to see where the turbulence is. We don't know upfront where the turbulence is going to be. Now, the question is how do we solve this particular problem? And actually, the solution is not that different. The only difference is that now we first need to do the maximization operator with respect to WT and then we do the minimization with respect to UT. So the way to solve it is So you first do maximization with respect to WT. Oh, there should be a WT here as well. So how do you solve it? You discretize XT, you discretize UT, and then you solve it you find what the maximum value of WT is going to be. Like whatever is the maximum value of WT for every XT UT pair. And so you get the you get the optimal solution for this. And then you put WT star there, and then you minimize with respect to UT. Okay, so first you take the maximization operator for a fixed XT UT, and then you do the minimization with respect to UT in order to solve the value function. And then the and then the gamma t of x t is my u t star. That's the optimal solution at x t. And then again, you do all the discretization business and you do all the maximization business. 
you have to do it all over again. And as you can see, this particular algorithm is far more sophisticated and difficult to implement than the earlier dynamic programming algorithm. Nonetheless, there are certain specific situations where this algorithm is much easier to implement. Um, like if the cost is quadratic function and these, these constraints are missing, and this is a linear function of xt, ut, and wt, then in those cases, implementing this algorithm is fairly easy, and what you get is a robust controller. Um, but in general, this particular control design technique is very hard. Comparative to PID controller, PID controller is always easy, okay? And PID controller has certain robustness property inherent into PID, the design of the PID controller. But if you have more sophisticated system, it calls for more sophisticated, robust control design. Uh, to give you an example, uh, if you have a re-entry vehicle entering the Earth's atmosphere, like you know, you, we send uh, astronauts into the space and they need to enter into the Earth's atmosphere, uh, simple PID controllers will not do the job, okay? Because there is a lot of environmental fluctuations. There is, the heat might uh, create some issues on the re-entry surface. So all of those needs to be fixed. I mean, all the, the re-entry process has to be robust to all of the potential variations that can happen at the time of re-entry. And so in those cases, the controller design takes a lot more sophisticated uh, process, uh, some of which might use uh, algorithms of this type. And typically what they do in those cases is not that they are computing these algorithms on the fly. They actually compute it upfront on supercomputers on Earth. And then they put this gamma T of XT, they hard code it in the, in the actual controller. And so the controllers then just implement this gamma T um, uh, on, on board. So they are not really computing it on the fly as the vehicle is entering the Earth. Uh, I mean, re-entry vehicle is entering the Earth's atmosphere. So all of this is something like, depending on which field you go to, um, you will know what the tricks of the trade are, and then you will pick, mix and match some of the algorithms we are talking about for different times of the, uh, of the uh, system. So to give you an example, again, when the rocket is going up, there's a lot of atmospheric disturbance. But when the rocket is in the orbit, there is no disturbance. I mean, literally, there is no atmosphere there. So you can pretty much, you pretty much have a deterministic system at that point of time because there is no disturbance. But again, when you are re-entering, again, you have disturbance, you have lots of uh, uh, issues that are uh, happening on the vehicle. And then you need to have, you need to be robust to all of the disturbances that the vehicle, re-entry vehicle is going to see or the rocket is going to see. Um, another example, how many of you have seen the SpaceX, um, a SpaceX rocket coming back and docking at the docking station, right? I don't know, some of you might have seen it. Um, those are also systems that needs robust controller. Because remember, you're doing that, that rocket is actually coming. It's an autonomous system, by the way. There's nobody controlling it while the rocket is coming and docking at the station. So it's an autonomous system, and it's coming in very close to the Earth's surface. Too much wind, there may be birds, there may be other disturbances in the air, potentially turbulence. Uh, so all of those disturbances are there. Those disturbances are uh, quite a lot closer to the Earth's surface. And it, that rocket is coming, and it's supposed to dock at a very specific point. It can't just land anywhere on the planet. It has to launch, uh, land at a very specific point. So if you've seen the early, like I, I don't know if you know, but like the first three SpaceX launches were a failure. And that's because uh, they needed a robust controller. And they didn't have the robust controller design at that point of time. And now they have fairly robust control system, and they don't fail anymore. Okay. So uh, in those cases, you really need this kind of algorithm. You can't just have a PID controller and expect that it'll work under all circumstances. You need to have more sophisticated controller design techniques to do that. So anyways, uh, 
Okay, so this is what you do at ca capital uh, time capital T, and then you go back one step, so I'll just write what Vt of xt looks like. It's the same thing, minimum over ut, maximum over wt, ct, xt, ut, wt. Vt plus one, Ft plus one. No, Ft, Xt, Ut, Wt. So you get the min max is the value function, and then gamma t, Xt is Ut star, the optimal solution. The minimizing value here of ut is what you store in gamma t. What is the drawback of this system? So I'm designing a controller based on this min max thing. What do you think is a drawback of this particular controller design technique? Combinatorial for every time step. It is computationally very complex. Anything else? Does maximization over WT at every time step work? Because suppose you're maximizing for the last time step. Right. You are at a particular, you're getting a particular UT. Correct. And then you're maximizing all the previous time steps. Correct. With that particular UT, you needn't reach that particular XT, right? Because it needed Right, so you're doing it, that's why you're doing it for all XT. You're not doing it for a specific trajectory, you're doing it for all possible things that could happen to that particular system. So you're doing this computation over the entire XT space. You know what other drawback of this particular system is the fact that you are taking the maximization here. So you are looking at the worst case situation, okay, the worst that could happen. Now for a rocket, it makes sense. For a reentry vehicle carrying an astronaut, it makes perfect sense. You really want to take into the worst case scenario into the account and you want to design your controller that is going to uh, make sure that the system works as intended. If you are running an autonomous vehicle, you really want to take into account the worst case things that can happen on the ground. But if you are creating the design for, like the controller for this building, you don't really want to take the worst case into account. The worst case for this room is there'll be 50 people in the room, okay? And they need to inject a lot of heat. So just imagine, what is the worst case thermal load on this building? When all the classrooms are full, all the offices are full, bunch of office hours happening everywhere, and lots of people in the corridor. That's the worst case situation that will happen in this building. Uh, should we design the controller for that worst case situation? And the answer is not really, because that event will never happen. And even if it happens, we'll be slightly uncomfortable, but nobody's going to die. Right? But if you do it for a reentry vehicle, if you don't build this algorithm for reentry vehicle or if you don't do it for autonomous vehicle, you get into a lot of trouble and problems and so on. So really, you have to be very careful when to apply the regular optimal control design technique, which is what we, did, we talked about earlier, and when to apply this minimax dynamic programming technique, which will give you the worst case controller, the controller that is best under the worst situation, under the worst sequence of WT that can potentially happen to your system. So anyways, for aerospace systems, this is uh, very important. Uh, if you're sending things to Mars, if you're sending things to Jupiter, you are getting astronauts back to Earth, you're going into the moon, uh, you really need to be robust to all potential variations that can happen in the environment. Because otherwise, the billions of dollars you've spent is just going to go away. I don't know if you know, but Elon Musk was close to bankruptcy after the third, after the third uh, crash of his uh, rocket, of the SpaceX rocket. So you can burn a lot of money very quickly if things go wrong in those systems. 
okay wonderful so uh, I have five more minutes so I want to spend some time talking about the tracking problem which is what we will be solving in the next class because tracking problem is something we can solve by hand we don't need uh, to use any computer or complicated optimization solver to, to solve the tracking problem. So I'll set the problem statement right here and then we can, uh, we can solve the problem later on. So I have a system, uh, let me name the problem. LQR. So I have a system, xt plus x t plus 1 equals to axt plus but, and I have the error. Uh, I want this xt to follow a specific trajectory. So let's say I want my desired trajectory. is x bar 1, x bar 2, x bar capital T, t plus 1. <clears throat> okay, so this is the trajectory that I want to follow. So I'm going from Earth to Mars. And I want to, I don't know if you know how to go from Earth to Mars, but if you happen to be on the journey, you will first go to Venus and then you will go to Mars. You won't just go to Mars like directly. So the way generally those trajectories work is you go from Earth to Moon and then there is a slingshot effect that sends you to Venus and then there is another slingshot effect that takes you to Mars, which is a very cool, cool thing, uh, by the way. So. Uh, you go closer to the sun and then you move away from the sun. That's the optimal trajectory, by the way. So you have a trajectory, you have a desired trajectory, and you want to follow that trajectory as closely as possible. So how do you set up the performance metric? How do you set up the cost function for this? Well, my cost function is I want to minimize, and there are no constraints on the system. So the cost function is I want to minimize xt minus x bar t transpose q xt minus x bar t plus ut transpose r ut and this t goes from 1 to capital T and then I have xt plus 1 minus x bar t plus 1 transpose qt plus 1 xt plus 1 minus x bar t plus 1. This is the cost function. This is my ct of ut, uh, xt ut, and this is my c capital T of xt plus 1. c capital T plus 1 of xt plus 1. Okay, so this is the problem that we want to solve in the next class. Okay, is the performance metric clear? Uh, oh, I, I haven't written, but Q is a positive semi-definite matrix. So Q is greater than or equal to zero and R is a positive definite matrix. So whenever I write a matrix and I say greater than or equal to zero, it means that the matrix is positive semi-definite. When I write a matrix which is strictly greater than zero, it means that the matrix is positive definite. So I have a positive semi-definite matrix here, I have a positive definite matrix here, and I want to find out what my gamma t is as a function of ut, as a function of xt, what my gamma t is so that I can optimize this particular uh, objective function. So we'll solve this particular problem on Monday by hand. 
and we'll show how to apply the principle of dynamic programming to solve the tracking problem, the LQR. This is known as an LQR problem. So L means linear. This is a linear system. Q is the quadratic cost here. And R is appearing here. Okay, So you get a linear quadratic uh, regulator problem. Regulator is basically trying to regulate this uh, uh, xt so that it's close to x bar t. So that's the regulator part. So this is known as a linear quadratic regulator problem and we'll solve it using dynamic programming on Monday. So have a great weekend and uh, see you guys on Monday.